I've talked about this just in text, but I haven't had a live person confirm it. Uh, my son, Alexander Jench, had about four to five months of sex checking and had to sign one inch thick, sign his life away that he would never tell me, his mom or anyone else, anything that went on uh, in his Sea Org days. And when mm -hmm. you routed out, I think I remember in Counterfeit Dreams, your, your book, how you, t t tell us about being on video camera <laughs> and you're <laughs> waiting for your $500 and you had to sign. Uh, give us a little story on that, Jeff. <laughs> well, this was after I had uh, left the base. All my possessions were in a storage unit in Beaumont, which is just over the hill. And I was driven to L.A. Uh, in my own car by a security guard. And um, we got to the, uh, the Hollywood Guarantee Building and went up to the OSIS floor, which I think is 11 or something like that. And went into a conference room and there were, well, there was the security guard who was with me. There was... Uh, an OSIS staffer, I think maybe two OSIS staffers, and a lawyer. And they had a stack of papers there for me to go through and sign. And this was at the end of the day, this was about midnight, and I had been going all day, packing my stuff and doing this and doing that, and I was dead tired and desperate to get out of there, just desperate to leave. And um, so I was of the mind, I'll, whatever, just, yeah, I'll sign whatever I have to sign. They had a video camera on me, <clears throat> and the security guard who was in uniform stood over to the over behind the camera so that mm. he wouldn't show in the picture, because otherwise that might look like duress, mm. which of course you know there's no duress here. <clears throat> there was just three people, you know, including a lawyer and a security guard. But regardless of that, I would have signed anything just to get out of there. And um, and so page after page, signing, signing, do you agree with this? Do you agree with Do you agree never to speak about anything about your CEO career? Oh, yes, I will never do that. <laughs> In the end, um, I knew that if I had said, you know, I don't want to do this anymore, I want to leave, as others have said, you know, you go through extensive handlings to be kept there. I knew that if I said I wanted to leave, I would be put on what's called the RPF's RPF, which, you know, I'm already working. <laughs> it's already intolerable circumstances. It's even more intolerable in the RPF's RPF. And in fact, a friend of mine had been there for eight months in the RPF's RPF trying to leave. So I did something that I knew that would get me kicked out immediately. And um, I actually uh, took a gulp of bleach because I knew that if I was considered a suicide risk that they would get rid of me immediately. And they did. Um, I was not suicidal, but that was the extreme that I went to to get myself out of there immediately. Um. I asked to route out from this organization in um, February of uh, 1997, or yeah, 1997, <coughs> and I was not allowed to. I basically was on the Rehabilitation Project Force, and um, I was told that I was not allowed to route out. I basically said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm fed up with this. If you guys don't let me out of here, I'm just going to stop eating and sleeping. And I'm just going to die because, you know, I wanted, I wanted my freedom. <laughs> I didn't like being treated like a prisoner when I'd done absolutely nothing wrong besides, you know, not wanting to work there anymore for nothing. So um, that night... Uh, I was talked into, you know, it's okay, you can get some sleep. It doesn't mean that, you know, they were saying maybe they would talk to me the next day about why I wanted to leave and treat me nicer. So I, I actually went to bed. I didn't keep my, my thread of not sleeping or eating. And that night I, I actually was able to run away. 
I, uh, I heard the two people outside my door guarding it uh, walk away from it, and I had gone to bed dressed. And I, this is out in Hemet, at the place that they called the ranch, or Happy Valley, which is a, they don't own it anymore, but they used to own it near the uh, Saboba Indian Reservation. But I was, there was like a search party that went out for me. They even had a dog. They had a couple of trucks, a bunch of people just out at, it was like four or five in the morning. Well, when I finally did um, have enough courage and had experienced enough abuse that I did finally decide to escape um, in January 2005, I drove off of the property on a motorcycle. Within 30 seconds of me leaving, I was being followed by an SUV that belonged to the security personnel there at the compound. Um, they chased me down the highway as I was heading into the local town, and they insisted that I come back. They're yelling at me out the window, you got to come back, you, gotta, you, you can't leave, uh, you know, think about what you're doing. And, um, and I just refused, I kept, continued to drive on, and they actually ran me off the road on my motorcycle. They literally just pushed me right off of the road. Um, I crashed. And um, when that happened, somebody driving by um, called 911. The only reason that I was able to escape was because I had police assistance. And I had two sheriff's deputies escorting me into the local town near the compound. And um, only by the threat of them being arrested by the police did they back off and let the police take me to safety. So when people say, why didn't you just leave, that, that's why. because. When you're there, you, you see and you hear what happens to people that try and leave. And most of the time, they're brought back. And in rare instances, people actually escape successfully and don't end up coming back. I said, if you come back, you'll get to talk to your sister. You'll get to talk to your husband, and we'll, you won't have to do the rehabilitation project for us, and we'll treat you better, and I made all these promises, and I wanted it to be true. But when I went back, I got stuck there for another three damn years, and my sister didn't talk to me, and my husband divorced me, and it, it was rough. I lost my will to live at one point, and they finally... Uh, stopped harassing me because they were afraid I was going to die on them. And uh, finally, um, they said, okay, you've signed everything and you can go. And they handed me an envelope with a check for $500. Well, before that moment, I had no idea what the severance pay was. And I was assuming, foolishly, that it would be at least a couple thousand dollars, enough to maybe uh, rent some place for a week, you know, or 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 uh, pay down on uh, on on rent. And you would think that they would give people at least enough to live for a month. Once you do get out, you don't have any money. You haven't lived in the real world. Um, you don't even know if you're going to be able to get a job. If you're going to be able to eat tomorrow. Then they send you a freeloader. Bill. And they never, they never had the balls to send me a freeloader bill. Uh, but, uh, but I'm sure that would have been a couple hundred thousand dollars at least for me because I had had so much training and so forth. Um, and I was, you know, and of course when you get out, you, you're still a Scientologist, you're still, you know, loyal to the cause. And I thought, okay, I'm going to get you know, I'm going to do my A to E, I'm going to get back on lines, I'm going to pay my freeloader debt. And after a couple of weeks, I said, that's bullshit. You know, I worked for them for 35 years, yeah. paid nothing, got nothing from them, and now I have to pay them? I said, forget it, forget it. And that was the moment when I said the magic words, I am not a Scientologist. Mm -hmm.